This is an Anel plain A262 80 watt T5 light fixture which I, shock and horror, purchased brand new a few days ago. Now I do have an excuse, I got a very good deal on these, basically a 4 for 1 deal, so I couldn't resist and just got them for video lighting down here in the workshop. So, do you want to have viewing this under, I believe, 240 watts worth of D T5s, which is nice, and this final fixture is going to bring that up to 320 watts, which is, should be well over 20,000 lumens worth, which is going to be enlightening, I suppose. But before we do that, I figured we'd just take this one apart in order to see what it's like inside, because uh, I did have one of them apart slightly before installing the first one, and uh, they seem to come with some rather high-end uh, drivers, so I figured we'd just uh, take that apart as well to see what goes into a one of these super fancy office uh, class uh, fluorescent electronic T5 ballasts. Let's go. Since these are just the standardized T5 fixtures, there really aren't too many specs about them which don't just relate to the tube you're using. But uh, we do have a reflector to care about, and uh, these have a wide angle upwards firing reflector as well as a 36 degrees pot down firing reflector. So they offer a relatively well balanced uh, light, at least as long as you have relatively low ceilings, which I do. They come delivered with uh, a an 80 watt, of course, uh, free facing Kelvin Osram tube installed, which are specified for a CRI of over 80 and uh, I believe 86 lumens per watt. They are made out of aluminium for the most part, but curiously they do have some magnetic irony parts as well, but uh, everything's painted matte white. They basically just turn into a giant matte white monolith, which uh, I quite like, and there really isn't much to say beyond that. So let's just start taking one apart and see what we get inside. So we start by just take the tube out. Now, you, <laughs> I wouldn't normally show this, but uh, I do like that they actually come with this little tube extractor arm, which just helps you turn the tube and get it out of a fixture. That's a very nice touch, I must say. These fixtures are also, this particular model is delivered with the uh, suspension wires for just uh, mounting them hanging down from the ceiling rather than just bolting them straight on. You also get a uh, two screws included, which I haven't yet figured out where they're supposed to go. The fixture itself comes apart by just uh, removing the four T20 screws you get in each end, which will basically cause the entire thing to explode on you and go into a million pieces. Curiously, I well, the last one had a few machine treaded screws and a few just uh, self tapping screws, which I find to be a bit odd. I suppose we'll find out what this one's got. This one's machine threaded. Yeah, you actually only need to undo two of each end since once you've undone two of them, and you flip it on its side, it should just pop into a couple of pieces. And I of course undid the wrong side since uh, there's quite obviously no ballast on this side. The ballast is down there. And once you remove the screws on the right side of the fixture, it should pop apart to reveal a ballast. So the ballast you get with these is a Tridonic Atco PCA 1 slash 80 T5 Eco IP. Why oh, is that an LP? And it's apparently a digital dimmable ballast which go from 1% to 100%. So this thing will go very, very dark. And uh, indeed, if you put it at 0% with a new tube, it'll just uh, go out. So it's a quite wide range device. And uh, most impressively, they say it's made in Europe. So, let's get this thing apart and find out what it's like inside. 
I also have no idea about what the smart part is. I'd wager it probably just goes to the internal processor because they're quite obviously this one in this thing. Worth noting is also the sheer size of this ballast. This is a single 80 watt ballast and just to look at how big it is compared to my Bryman BM869 here, it's almost twice as long as the multimeter and pretty damn well bigger than my hand. You could probably get a cheaper ballast down to about half the size or at least you'd get a double ballast this size, but no, this is a single ballast, so they might have done some quite reasonable engineering on the inside. So to get the ballast apart you just uh, prise up the edge of, of it. Uh, I would like to actually get it out of the fitting, but uh, I can't really figure out a proper way to undo these uh, terminals without damaging the wiring. I'd rather not have to redo all the wiring. That's just too much of a bother. So, we'll do it inside. Perhaps we can get the board out anyway. But it's mostly what's on the top that's going to be of interest. And there we go. So the most obvious feature of this thing is that it's uh, wrapped in some kind of a protective plastic cover. I'm not entirely certain what that's good for, but it's an extra step, so you just have to be happy for it. And once we get that out of the way, we're presented with some rather more interesting things. And once you take a closer look at the inside, it really becomes very obvious that all the fun stuff is happening on the underside of a board. Uh, because we do have a lot of input protection going on here, and a little transistor, it seems, ZTX parts. So all this is going to be input filtering. We have no, no less than three uh, PTCs for probably fusing. They are labelled F6, uh, F7 and F10, so they are probably just in series with everything. Big, probably common mode choke. And uh, I'm not entirely certain what this part is. It looks more like a transformer than anything else. You either a transformer or a big uh, choke for something. It really doesn't look like it's something that's part of the filtering circuitry. It's got to too fine winding for that and it actually seems to have two windings so there you go on the other side we've got the smart connector so perhaps this is some kind of isolated supply for some uh, logic stuff happening on the other si underside of the board here we've got a large uh, filtering capacitor and uh, here we've got the primary filtering capacitor for the entire device it seems or at least the driver and it's a Rubicon BXC series, which is uh, a 105 degree rated cap that's rated for 12,000 hours of runtime. So, this is a very high end component. Uh, a bit disappointingly, though, they've left it flapping in the breeze, it isn't uh, glued down to the board. Beside it, we've got a another rather impressively rated uh, cap. It's a Rubicon uh, RX30 series capacitor, which is a 4,000 hour. 130 degree rated capacitor. So they've certainly not skimped on these electrolytics. They are both extremely high end uh, products. Moving on, we've got a bit of an oddball part uh, hiding beneath these two transformer looking things. Which, this is a an LNK304PN, which uh, is a capacitive dropper replacement, which is specified uh, for extremely high efficiency, although the only figure I could find uh, in the data sheet was 75% uh, in some application. The efficiency is uh, of course going to vary a lot depending on how you use this thing, but it's uh, certainly going to be a lot more efficient than a capacitive dropper. And beyond that we really just seem to have a rather barren landscape where they've uh, removed all the parts required for the second channel. Uh, because this can quite obviously be a dual channel device. Although they do seem to have skimped out in a filtering coil here because we've got a large footprint labelled L6 where we've just got a jumper link going across. So that's a bit of a cheap out, although I have no doubt that this thing is going to live up to all the noise requirements of any standard agency anywhere. 
and we've just got uh, probably another filtering call on the output and a couple of coupling caps and feedback resistors and then we go off to the tube. But really at this stage I'm quite curious to find out what's on the underside of the board because we've really just got the power stuff going on on the top side. And uh, there, there has to be a processor in here because this is a dimmable fixture, it has a rather fancy dimming system as well. So I almost have to get try and get this board out. I think we might have a shot at just uh, sliding it out because it doesn't seem to be anchored in. Actually, it is anchored in because uh, we have our ground connection right here in the corner, which is a jumper link, which is just uh, jammed into a couple of uh, metal springy type things which uh, come from the metal casing, which uh, I quite like that solution. It's going to be a very firm connection and it's going to be very cheap to produce since they can just shove the board in and have the ground automatically connected without any nuts or bolts or anything. That's a very nice design, I really like that. But it does make it a bit more difficult to get the board out. Uh, the board is secured by little metal tabs which have been pushed in from the outside and it's not a big deal to undo them except for the fact that a couple of them are just by this transformer here so I run a really big risk of damaging that if I try to undo them yeah, that's a real big bother a real big bother, I'm going to have to think about how to go about this for a while ah, they were a lot easier to access if you just undid this side so the board actually tilted up a bit, so it should pop out reasonably easily as, like, as long as we can undo the earth clip. And yeah, there it goes. Come on. Oh dear, this board is bending. Not bad, that. There we go. That's certainly a lot of stuff going on. So what do we have? Well, for starters we can notice that we've got a very high quality FR4 type board, very obviously. And we've got, uh, I think, no less than three rectifiers. Because these three parts definitely look, look the part. And we've got a couple of extra diodes there. This looks like... This is an N-channel FET, and this is a dialogue DO938FBLF, and this is obviously the brains of the unit. And we've got a, a part labelled LD33, another diode there. This is going to be another rectifier, it's labelled... LV8357TXB I've got no idea what that might be More N-channel FETs over here uh, This looks... This is labelled FQD2N100 Curiously, there isn't really too much going on on the underside either I was expecting there to be more smarts to this, but this uh, dialogue chip is quite clearly going to be a, an extremely highly integrated uh, dual T5 driver chip. And uh, that, that makes for a rather clean and neat solution, I suppose. Well, we do have actually quite a lot of little surface mount caps and resistors going on there, but yeah, that's not much to talk about, and we've got a lot of unpopulated stuff going on there. Hmm, no idea about what that's all about. So there isn't as much fun going on here as I was hoping there to be. Oh yeah, now I know what uh, this big uh, choke looking thing on over here is all about. These things are power factor corrected, so this is going to be a giant power PFC choke. Obviously, because a power factor, uh, when I checked it, is uh, 1.0. They have perfect power factor. So you need some kind of active circuitry in order to take care of that. Curiously though, despite that, they are not universal voltage. They are 
is best for a 220 to 240 volt operation, within some tolerance of course. It probably has to do with the fact that they try to make these things silly efficient. Hmm, hello, we have a bit of an oddity in the mounting of these big caps here. Probably won't be able to show it properly on camera, but uh, they actually have the leads folded in, like so. And the mating holes are too close together for the actual parts used. Did they run out of the properly sourced parts? That's the case for both of these. Hmm. Definitely doesn't seem to be the way it's intended to be assembled. And here's a quick look at the datasheet for this ballast, which essentially puts, forward, puts it forward as being a high-end unit, since uh, it uh, supposedly is classed as the highest possibly energy class, Selma EEI equals A1 BAT. Now, I have no idea about uh, the actual politics be behind those classes, but being the highest possible energy class is probably a pretty good thing. And if we have a peek at uh, the efficiency ratings for these, we can see that they are rated for 80 watts, and the circuit power is rated for 85 and a half watts, and that puts it to just shy of 94% efficiency, which uh, I don't think anyone would class as being bad, and at a power factor of 0.99, which also certainly is not bad for any device. We also have some rather impressive reliability specs, which you would expect given the uh, quality of the components used. Uh, a nominal life of 100,000 hours at 50 degrees, with a failure rate of maximum 0.2% per thousand hours. That's... that's very, very good. If you were to have that kind of failure rate in other stuff you use, you'd never have to buy anything new, and the entire capitalist China economy would collapse straight down on its face, so we obviously can't have that. We're also delivered with a five-year guarantee, but uh, I hopefully won't have to use that. And they just keep on going about all the intelligent things about it. There are so many things this thing will do that I'm just not going to use. The only real feature being used in these uh, fittings uh, is the uh, switch dim function, which uh, allows you to dim it by just uh, holding the power switch down for a set amount of time, and the light will dim up and dim down in brightness. Uh, I was a bit surprised actually to find out that the light switch fitted to these fixtures is a soft switch. It just uh, connects uh, a couple of pins on the microcontroller together, it seems, because uh, they do not break the mains coming in. And they, they are just a momentary switch which is connected while they hurl it down. So, that's a bit of a mm, not nice thing, I suppose. When you turn your light off, you would expect it to not go in standby, but you'd rather expect it to be completely turned off, although. They've probably intended uh, the use of external switches, which actually turn it off 100%, and that's indeed what I'm doing, so it's a non-issue, non really. These units are also specified for emergency light use, and they have a DC specification, so they're specified for 176 to 250 volts DC, so you could uh, run the use of a high-voltage DC bus if you wanted to. I wonder how popular that is, actually, just running a high-voltage uh, DC bus uh, as emergency lighting. They supposedly turn on to 15% brightness when, when the voltage switches from AC to DC, so that's that's a very nice feature. Very nice feature indeed. Would it would allow the building to basically save in on all um, extra emergency lights they install. And they are, of course, approved for some silly high standard emergency lighting specifications, so there you go. And I think that more or less sums it up for the ballast, really. It's just an extremely highly integrated thing with 99% of the stuff going on in the dialog IC. I mean, the only real external thing we have is the uh, 12 volt power supply. So. All I've got to do now is uh, put this thing back together and uh, figure out a place to hang it.
and just for the hell of it, here's how the rest of the fixture comes apart. So here in the end, opposite of the power connectors, you have the power switch dimming thing, which is just attached by two screws to the case, nothing too exciting about that whatsoever. And that's actually a kind of cool mechanism where you have a string coupled switch. Hmm. Can't say I've seen that before. And that just connects one pin of the mains to a pin on the ballast. The tube sockets themselves are just uh, poked into a couple of holes on the metal end cap and uh, the reflectors just uh, they're basically just held in place by the pressure of the extruded aluminium edges of the ballast, of the fixture. So they come apart like so. And this is the, obviously the upward facing wide angle reflector and this is the downward facing spot reflector. It seems to divide the light a bit 50-50. I suppose you could just remove this if you didn't want it and just have a very wide light both upwards and downwards. The entire thing is uh, painted white, so it should do a decent enough job anyway. I don't think you'd lose much stability because nothing seems to rely on this uh, reflector to stay together. And all of these little light amy things just uh, pop out if you squeeze them together, like so. And they are also what uh, keeps the two halves of the entire reflector assembly together. So this is basically a three part design if you include the little bits of air as one part. And over here on the other end we just have the mains input which is held together and in there by a little vice thing really and just some connectors. That's features that we actually grounded this. That's very nice, even though the rest of the case is grounded too, they aren't just relying on it to uh, scratching through the paint in order to ground it. And you do get uh, a plug installed from the factory on these, and a very nice, actually shielded mains cable. And no, yeah, you can't see it, since it goes straight into that uh, little grippy thing, but uh, and when you take the part of the plug, it actually is shielded, and the shield is connected to ground, so that's a really nice touch. Taking just the last edge of the EMI, even though the uh, ballast is specified for some silly good EMI performance. Something I'm a bit uh, disappointed in, though, is that they've just uh, taped these wires in like that during production, so that's going to fall apart with the years, but there's nothing sharp in here anyway, so it doesn't really make much of a difference. And here is the moment of truth. Will it still light after we've had it apart? Yes, it will. Uh, that, that's a bit of an odd thing with these uh, fixtures. They seem to be set to being dimmed just slightly out of a box. I had one which was set to you know, just 50 watts on the input, and this one seems to be set to just under 80 watts. Although it is climbing a bit, so I suppose that might be due to this being a brand new tube which has never been lit before. And I think that more or less sums it up for this uh, Anel A262 80 watt T5 fixture. So, thank you ever so much for watching. Cheerio!